Thank you so much, Irene. All right, church, good to see you again on another Thursday night. Cell phones off. Make sure mine's off. No, I'm just playing. All right, guys, good to be back on another Thursday night. Excited to be here, of course, as we just got done praising, worshiping through music. My question is, what did you feel when the music hit your ear? Usually music moves us. Interestingly, did you know, of course, God being the orchestrator or the designer behind all of music and even made us as humans to respond to music? Did you know that? All throughout the scriptures, Genesis to Revelation, there is the use of music in not only man, woman, declaring the worthiness, the value of God, but he's created us to do so. In fact, to not do so is to say you have no breath in your lungs because the Psalms say the only disqualifier to praise is to be dead. Literally. It says everything that has breath, praise the Lord. So I don't know about you, but if you got life inside of you, then we need to be singing. We need to be praising. And you know what? That's a declaration from the word. That's not a declaration from me. So with that being said, the preface really is me explaining the importance of music. As you can see from the screen, we've titled tonight's message, The Song of the Soul, Leaning into the Rock and Learning How to Roll. (laughs) Rock and roll, did you get it? Anyway, it makes sense up here. If it doesn't make sense when it comes out here, then take that up with God, because he dropped it on me. So what is music? What is it with music? I'll tell you. They did a couple experiments. This is amazing. They took the same athlete. They ran him through a performance course. First, with no music at all, and they timed him. They actually, they took down his scores, how much weight he was pushing, how fast he was running. They took that same athlete, then they put him with his preferred music, motivational, and they ran him through that same course, and he blew his numbers away. You see, there was something about the music that was motivating him, and they also took two work groups. They allowed one work group to pick their music to work to. Then they allowed the other work group doing the same workload, and they made them listen to the the, the music that they chose for them. The discovery that the ones that chose their music performed more effectively and efficiently by day's end than the ones who were forced to listen to music that they did not choose. So what am I saying? I'm saying if God has given us music to sing songs and not only physiologically created us to respond to music, uplift us emotionally, move us physically, and then connect with us spiritually, I'm saying, what if he became the song of my soul? Not just that I'm singing him a song from my soul. What if he became the actual song to my soul? Am I making that up? No, I'm not. In fact, after the Israelites were delivered from the Egyptians as they were pursuing them to that rock in a hard place from last Thursday, and they turned to God, they grumbled, they complained. Moses said, stand still, be still, and know that he's in control, and you will see the salvation of the Lord. What happened next? The Red Sea, it literally split. They walked through the Red Sea, and then the waters came caving in on the Egyptians. On the pursuer, God said, I am greater. Watch what the result was. In Exodus 15, it says this, then Moses and the children of of Israel sang this song to the Lord. Let me repeat that. They sang this song to the Lord, saying, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed gloriously. The horse and its rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will praise him. He, look at this, I'm going to sing you a song, Lord. And in the middle of him singing the song to the Lord, he said, hold up a second. I'm not just going to sing you a song. You are my song. In other words, you're the one that moves me. You're the one that uplifts me emotionally. And you are the one that connects with me spiritually. That's the divine design behind music. I'm not just saying actual music we listen to the ear. I'm talking about making the song of your soul Jesus Christ. And he will move you emotionally, spiritually, and physically. Now watch how many times this is repeated Through scriptures, the psalmist, David, writes, The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. Isaiah writes, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For Yah, the Lord, is my strength and song, for he is my salvation. Now, what does that lend itself to? That the writers are saying, God, I'm not just going to sing a song. I am declaring that you are 
my song. I thought about that. The word strength and song, it's kind of, when we read it, we say, that don't even fit. He is the strength, and he's also a song. Yeah, in other words, if you were to put the two words together in the original language, the writer is saying, Lord, you are my strong song. And then he invites us to do what? Sing along. But not just by lip syncing, but by my life getting in sync with his life. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't need music physically, outwardly, for Jesus to move within me. When I meditate on him being the song of my soul, ultimately what I'm saying, God, you are in complete control. No matter what's going on around me, no matter what's moving, when I know the song of my soul is God within me, there's a peace that floods me. It overcomes me. So the world will try to get me to move to its beat, but I won't to know the truth. And that tune in me moves me or like we're gonna learn tonight when I lean into the rock and I learn to roll that's the song of my soul so with that preface in mind let us transition out of the understanding that if Jesus is my song then what is this rock and roll talk same psalmist David writes in Psalms 18 I will love you O Lord my strength the Lord is my rock my fortress my deliverer the very first mentioning of strength is actually the word rock. So let's read it like that. I will love you, O Lord, my rock. The Lord is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer. These are amazing imageries. Remember, we talked about the Psalms being poetic in nature. When the writer was writing it, he had to put intentional thought into it. Anybody ever write poetry in here? You know, you don't just sit down and begin spilling it out. You have to think about it. Each line is connected with the previous line. And sometimes you have to write a forward line before you can go back and connect that certain word with that line. This is what he's writing. He's thinking. What does he mean when he says, the Lord is my rock? The Lord is my fortress. The Lord is my deliverer. Well, what do we know about rocks? They're sturdy. They're stable. They're immovable. It is impossible, church, to fall through a rock. Did you know that? It's impossible. You can't sink through a rock when you're standing on solid ground. You can't fall through that. It is literally immovable. And of course, as Jesus taught, it is foundational. Did he not say, hey, whoever does these sayings of mine, my word, whoever follows my teachings, whoever is obedient to my word, I'll liken him to a man, a wise man who built his house on the rock. In other words, when you build your life on him, no matter what storm hits your home, you will not fall. And then the comparison, of course. There's always comparison. Hey, those who have heard my word, I love that part. We often miss that. Those who have heard my word but don't do my word, I will call that person a fool because they built their house on sand. And it doesn't take much for a storm to knock that type of sand castle down. Now, that's the word rock. That's what I think of, the fortress aspect. When David wrote this, now let's keep in mind, David, when he was younger, was on the run from King Saul. And a lot of times in scriptures, David found his fortress or his hiding in a cave. He would write certain meditations, contemplations, and even certain psalms from that position. As he looked around, you know what that cave represented? It wasn't necessarily isolation. It wasn't that he was fleeing. In those caves, he found his security. That's what a fortress is. Now, when you think of a fortress, you may think of a big castle. That's fine, too. The fortress, the idea behind a fortress is somewhere you can go and find refuge. Somewhere you can go and find security. Somewhere you can go and hide in and not worry about the fears of the world. There's security in the fortress. Then finally, the word deliverer. Deliverer explains one who calls us to escape. One who rescues us. This is amazing. Here he gives these imageries. Let's do it again. Rock, fortress, deliverer. All connected, as we'll find out. Now, there's a certain Bible verse. It's 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, or 13 and 14. And it says this. But let him who thinks he stands take heed, lest he fall. What are you standing on? That's my question. What are you standing on tonight? Some of you are standing on material things. That's your foundation. 
And it's only a matter of time before it crumbles. Some of you are standing on an actual relationship. Let him who thinks he stands on solid ground take heed. Look around you. What's below you? Lest you fall. What does that mean? Watch what it says next. No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. God is faithful who will not allow us to be tempted beyond what we are able. He will not allow you to be tested. He will not allow opposition, persecution to hit you beyond what you are able. Now, because he is faithful in the midst of that temptation, it then says he will provide the way out that you can bear it. Let's step back. Because that word, the way, sometimes we think, wait a second, when I am in temptation, when I am in opposition, there's no way out. No, you're looking at it all wrong. It's not a way out. It's the way while you're in. It's Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. In other words, he joins you, and he's your rock that you stand on so you can't sink. He's your fortress that you hide in and you feel secure. And he is your deliverer in the moment away from fear, away from these other emotions like worry and anxiety. Jesus delivers you in the moment, and he gives you his peace. That's what he's talking about in that verse. Here's a story. Soldier fleeing from his enemy, fleeing, panicking. They're behind him. His life is on the line. He runs past a cave. There's a tight opening. He crawls into the space. He then is out of breath. He hears their footsteps close behind. He begins to cry out to the Lord, Lord, save me. Lord, deliver me. I do not want to die here. And as he's praying that prayer, he watches a spider literally dangling from that opening. And it begins to create a web. And he literally says to God, I'm praying for my life and you send a spider? The moments went by. The enemy came close. As they got in front of that opening, he heard them talking. They saw the spider web spread out in the opening and they thought and reasoned, there's no way a man could be in that cave because that spider web was intact. He then was delivered and rescued, and he said these wise words, where God is, a spider's web is as a stone wall, and where God is not, a stone wall is as a spider web. He delivers. He is the rock that you can hide in. He is the fortress that gives security. He is the one we need to be standing on. I wanna stop and highlight verse two again. The Lord being our rock. And I don't know about you, when I think of rock, I think about this giant mountain, rock, or I think about a giant cliff with a rock base. I don't know why. Then there's another side of rock that I think about, and I'll tell you that in a second. But this word rock, beautiful imagery, is this. It's a physical element. That's all it is. David was just writing about a physical element. To us, it's a spiritual reality. And that reality is this. When you ask yourself, what is he talking about? What is the rock? What is the reality? I'll tell you. On Christ, the solid rock, I stand. All other ground is sinking sand. That's the reality. In fact, I would conjecture and say that all of your life has been divinely designed to get you to experience that reality, that the rock of Jesus Christ is the only solid ground that we should stand on. I would even dare to say that all of the happenings of your life have been ordained, predestined, so that God could bring you to a certain point called humility. And you know what that point is? It's rock bottom. You know, when you hear about rock bottom, people literally think about a failure. Man, they hit rock bottom. They, they think about a fall, a great fall. He was up here on this mountain of success, and because of whatever, he had a great fall. That's rock bottom. But you know what I'm here to say? Rock bottom is a position of submission. People say, Matt, you hit rock bottom. Yes, I did, and I haven't left since. Because that rock below me is the solid ground Hallelujah. on which I stand I don't know who said this quote, but it goes like this. God will allow you to hit rock bottom so that you would discover that he is the rock at the bottom. Now, again, let me say it like this. Rock bottom is not a fall. It's not a failure. It's actually a feel of faith. You can get into the position of submission, not through a failure. I say to the students all the time, hey, me, humiliation, chose me because I failed to choose humility. 
You can get to rock bottom by failing, by falling, but it doesn't have to be that way, church. Whether you are on your knees looking down, whether you are standing up looking forward, or whether your hands are raised to the sky, rock bottom is the position where your heart is surrendered and you're standing on solid ground. No matter where you're at, in the deepest pit, on the highest mountain, it is the position where I'm on my back and I can only look up. It is also the position where you come to the realization, rock bottom, that there's nothing in this world that can give you security and your ultimate and full security can only come in God most high. That's rock bottom. Rock bottom comes to us throughout these characters that I'm gonna give you. First and foremost, Joseph. What was Joseph's rock bottom? Think about it. Here's a young man, has a dream, shares his dream with his brothers. They wind up turning on him. They throw him into a pit. They sell him into slavery. He ends up in prison. Ultimately, when we get to the end of Genesis 50, he's in a palace. Well, guess what? Rock bottom was at the bottom of the pit. Rock bottom was in the prison. Rock bottom was in the palace. Because the word of God says, and the Lord was with Joseph. But guess what? The Lord can't be with a man unless the man chooses to be with the Lord. He humbled himself. He served those around him. Rock bottom for God to allow that to touch his life is this. His rock bottom was so that the rise back to the top would allow him to point to the rock. Did you get that? Why does God allow us to go into the pit sometimes? Why does he put us in a certain type of emotional prison? For some, physical prison, a spiritual prison. Here's why. Because the distance from the bottom back to the top is so obvious that when you get back to the top, you can point to the rock. And nobody can deny the work of God in your life. It's that obvious. It is that outrageous. Consider me. I'm up on a platform preaching God's word. I used to wear a state uniform that was brown. I had a number, 314525E. I was surrounded by walls. I couldn't get up and leave. I was locked up, locked in, yet here I stand and God said, I'll show the world what I can do with a man when he hits rock bottom, when he stays at rock bottom, and I put him back at the top and he points to the rock. Church, like Joseph, people may be coming at you, they may cross you, they may proverbially throw you in a pit. They may sell you out, sell you down the creek. You stay at rock bottom. You keep humbling yourself. You keep trusting that God has a plan. And when he puts you back on that solid ground, nobody can deny that he's there in your life. Then there's this guy named Jonah. We know Jonah's story. We know what he did. The historical account says God said go, and he said no. And he went the other way. And what happens, he ends up in the belly of a whale. Now, this is amazing. God was with him. The very part that I love is chapter one of Jonah. And it says this from Jonah's own mouth. In the belly of a whale, I cried out to the Lord because of my affliction, and he heard me. Did you get that? I cried out, I just rebelled from you, God. I just disobeyed you, God. I just rejected your will for me, oh God. I'm in the belly of a whale. How low can you go? Yet it says he cried out in the midst of his affliction and God heard him. In other words, rock bottom is that when God allows you to go low, it's so that you will call out on high. You ever been brought low and you didn't know why? Maybe it was because of your own sin, your own disobedience, and you found yourself literally in the belly of turmoil. Well, guess what? Rock bottom is surrendering, no matter where you're at, calling out on high, even though you've gone low. And the end result, God will bring you exactly where he needs you in the long run. Now, of course, there'll be consequences. There's consequences when we're disobedient. Sin can linger. It can affect. However, God's plan will ultimately come through when you cry out to high, even though you are very low. That's Jonah's rock bottom. Then Job. Oh, poor Job. Man. But the window of heaven was open to us. Again, chapter one in Job. The window. God said, you want to see this conversation going on between me and devil? And the conversation's amazing because God's the one that put Job out there. Did you know that? Hey, where you been, devil? I've been snooping around, lingering, 
going to and fro on the whole earth like a roaring lion, seeking whom I may devour. Oh yeah, you got somebody in mind? How about my servant Job? Because there's nobody like him. If Job heard that conversation, he'd be like, really God, really? <laughs> but he doesn't know that conversation. And we know the result, he loses everything. He loses his livelihood, his livestock. He loses his children. Now you read the word, you study the life, it comes to the very end. Job questioned. Job grieved. Job hurt. Nobody can lose that much stuff and not feel the effect. Job was not a robot. But in the very end, you know what was intact? Not only his faith, his integrity. The word was integrity. His integrity was intact. What was Job's rock bottom? Job's rock bottom was an opportunity to prove that God's glory is best seen in bedrock integrity. Things may happen to you. You may lose stuff. You may lose a loved one. It's your response in the midst of that tragedy to maintain your bedrock integrity that gives God all the glory. What's attractive is when I saw my mom and dad bury a son, my older brother, and they were able to say, we don't like the way this feels, but we trust that God is always good. That was integrity through the hardest of trials. You see, God was getting all the glory from Job's response, all the glory from his reaction to things, to the naked eye, did not look good, did not feel good. And of course, we would ultimately say they are not good. But if God allowed them, church, I'm telling you, by his sovereignty, by his permissive will, his secret will, and all that is in his good will, if he's allowed it to touch your life, you better believe it had to pass through the scarred hands of Jesus Christ. There's a purpose in that. Then Joshua. Joshua was a young man. He was the protege to Moses. Moses passed away. The Lord called him home. He then turns to Joshua. Joshua has this huge feat in front of him. He has to lead millions of his countrymen, the Israelites, into the promised land. We don't know what he was feeling, but God kind of exposes it for us. It doesn't say that Joshua was shaken in his boots. He wasn't scared, but God reveals that he was. He says, Joshua, Moses is dead. In other words, you can't look to man anymore. You got to look directly at me. I have the plan. Joshua, do not be afraid, which tells me he had to have been afraid. Joshua, be not dismayed. Joshua, do not fear. Joshua, I am with you. That would have infused into his soul, his spirit. He would have been motivated because the song of the soul was the Lord. That was his strong song. And he said, with that motivation, I can lead these people into the promised land. What was his rock bottom? I'll tell you, his rock bottom was that a moment of fear, God would take and infuse into a movement of faith. So all across the board, everybody's rock bottom is going to look different. It's what you do in that position of submission that will make all the difference. I would stay at rock bottom. And I know that my Lord meets me there because he is below me. He is the ground that I stand on. He is literally the foundation that I build on. And then he becomes the mountain, the fortress. And eventually, as we discover, the strong tower. The Lord is my rock. The Lord is my fortress. The Lord is my deliverer. The next part, my shield. The imagery continues. The horn of my salvation, my stronghold. The shield. What do we know about a shield? One word, protection. Soldiers would use a shield for protection. Then he uses the horn of my salvation. There's many explanations. There's many translations to the horn of salvation. Some say he's talking about a mountain. A horn, when you looked at mountains from a distance, it looked like a horn. Some say he's actually talking about a horn on a beast. That was for their strong protection. Some say they're talking about the horn on a shield or the horns you would see on battle helmets. Makes no difference. All of them are talking about power. The shield's protection, the horn is power. And then interestingly, I wanna stay here for a moment. What is a strong tower or stronghold? It's the part of a wall that gave perspective. When you call him your strong tower, you're saying, you have the perspective of my life. You could see what I can't see. 
There's a reason why coaches stay up in the booth during a football game, because they have a strong perspective on what's going down below. Sometimes I don't have that perspective. I only see my problem, and then I define God through my problem. And God said, no, if you see the problem through me, everything will change. When he is my strong tower, when he is my strong perspective, I'm understanding this, that he's my stronghold. What? Yeah, because the word stronghold lends itself to another Bible verse. Corinthians says this, For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war in the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God. For what? Pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments in every high thing, perspective, that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Interestingly, what does your stronghold look like? I'll tell you. It's anything that has a strong hold on your life. We don't got to get all spiritual and talk about strongholds. Anything that has a strong hold on you is a strong hold over you. It could be an addiction. It could be a bad attitude. It could be a lust. It could be a relationship. It could be anything as small as a private lie to a public failure that you can't get over. A stronghold has a stronghold on you. How do we get through strongholds? Can I tell you? To pull down, you have to lift up. What? Yeah, to pull down that stronghold on your life, you just got to look up and lift your eyes and see the salvation of the Lord at the cross. Because it was at the cross when you see Christ on the cross that you see the place where every stronghold was demolished. When you see Christ on the cross, you see the place where God's strong hold on your life is accomplished. It is when your perspective raises and sees that God loved you that much that he was willing to send Jesus to die in your place, to pay the sin debt that we owe in full, to literally demolish any stronghold of sin, of self, of Satan over your life, and then give you himself as a stronghold a grip that no one can snatch you out of for your life. I gave him my life. I've leaned into the rock. I've continually said, Lord, I see the cross. I am forgiven. I need you today. And then I turn and I feel the weight that I thought I left fall right back on me. And I'm saying it did. I'm telling you, church, it did. You did give your life to Jesus. He did die for that weight, that guilt, that shame, that stronghold. But we forgot Though we leaned into the rock, we forgot to learn how to roll. Cast your burden onto the Lord. He cares for you, and he will sustain you. You see, that's what the cross is all about. It is a position where even though I know he meets me there, he wants me to engage in relationship with him there. We often so easily can come to an altar, whether in the privacy of my home or the public church, give my life to the Lord, and then when I walk out those doors, a day goes by, a week goes by, and what I thought I gave literally comes back on me. And I'm saying it did. It did, because in the relationship aspect, we are required to cast. The word cast means to violently throw, hurl, or roll. But the Greek definition comes this way. You're going to roll it with the idea that most likely it's going to roll right back on you. And if you're like me, you'd say, Lord, what gives? Again, you told me to cast. I did. I prayed it up. I read it out. And it hits me right back on my shoulders. And in this beautiful illustration, I gave it a long time ago, we learned the process that God wants to use to get to know us intimately. Consider a father who goes outside with his young son. Do you remember this? And he gets a ball out and he says, all right, boy, we're going to have catch and he throws the ball to his son. The son is new. The son catches it but fumbles and drops it. The father does not yell at him. He simply says, son, just pick it up and throw it back. The son does so clumsily. He throws it back to the father. He catches it, says, good job, boy. Then he throws it back to the son. The son this time lets it hit his chest, but he catches it that time. He throws it back. 
The father says, that's how you do it, son. Now here it comes. Catch it with just your hands. And he throws it, and he catches it with just his hands. And he says, now throw it back. And the boy throws it back. And the father catches it and throws it to the son. The son catches it and throws it back to the father. Now they're having catch. Now they're having interaction. And what he couldn't do ultimately in the beginning, he's doing finally at the end. Why? Because that's the relationship God wants to have with us. Yes, you cast your care to him. Yes, it might fall back on you. Throw it back to him. Roll it back to the cross. And in that, you get out of religion and you enter into relationship. Cast your care unto the Lord because he cares for you. <laughs> Amazing, the word burden in the text, Psalm 55, 22. Again, this same verse comes to us written by Peter in the New Testament. The word burden, it really is so broad. You would want the word burden to be defined so you can say, that's what I'm dealing with. That's the burden I'm dealing with. But God said, no, a burden, whether negative or positive, is anything that I've allowed to touch your life by providence. What? Yeah, a gift could be a burden. And God gave you the gift, but he wants you to give it back to him for his glory. It could be guilt. God allowed the guilt to hit you for a reason. It's to move you to humility, to remorse, to repentance. Godly sorrow produces repentance leading to salvation. There's a purpose in all of it. And God says, regardless of what the burden is, it could be a damaged relationship. That's the burden God has allowed. It could be uncertainty with your work. It could be a negative report. It could be a sickness, an illness. It could be a wayward child. Whatever that is allowed into your life by providence, God says, give it back to me. Give it back to me. Because my purpose in allowing it is to conform you into the image of my son Jesus. That is the ultimate purpose of God for mankind, to make us look like Jesus. And the reason why he allows burdens to touch us, because if there's no burden on me, I'll start looking just like me. I'll start doing me. I'll go out there and live selfishly. So God says, I need a burden to knock you out of that, to detach you from it, so that you begin to look like my son. Because when you start looking like him, you start looking like peace and joy and love and that's what the world needs to see i'm always so confused when i hear about the church being so secluded from the world we are sent to show them jesus i'm sent out there to show them love to show them the peace of god to show them the joy my tongue's not supposed to speak like they speak when they grumble i praise when they worry, I worship. When they hate, I love. When they step over someone, I stoop down and pick up. I am not to look like the world. I need to show them what he looks like. Church, he'll allow a burden to hit us so that we can give it back to him. Now, it's been eight plus years. Now, I got to get real and I got to get raw. March 7, 2009, I am responsible for an at-fault drunk driving fatality, a decision I think about daily, a decision that I have to cast back up to the Lord because that guilt will consume me. Shame will arise within me. I will be useless on this platform if I allow that condemnation to get the best of me. I sat in August of last year with my precious and beautiful wife, Sarah, in Colorado Springs across the table doing an internationally broadcasted interview with Dr. James Dobson. Told him my story. He's asking questions. If you don't know who he is, he is a child psychologist, a well-known speaker, and a New York Times best-selling author of several books. And I got to the point in my story where I talked about not only what I did, but at the outcome of my sentencing day, the victim's family, his son, forgave me. And I talked about that being the catalyst. I said, Dr. Dobson, on that day, January 7, 2010, the day I went to prison, the day I was physically incarcerated, was the very day I was spiritually liberated. I went into a cold, dark cell, yet I had so much peace on the inside. Dr. Dobson, being a psychologist, knowing that he didn't want his listeners to be confused, pulled a question that many people will want an answer to. Brilliant. He said, let me get this straight. You left the courtroom, you're in a dark cell. How do you have peace? Did the condemnation of what you've done and where you were not hit you? Did, you? did you elude it? Did you escape it somehow? And that question came. And I had to think about it. And then God gave me the verse, Romans 8, chapter 1. There is, therefore, now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, 
For the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. Yes, condemnation hits me, but I know where to cast it. I know where to roll it. I'm learning how to lean into the rock, and I'm learning how to roll it back to the rock. To lean into the rock and learn how to roll is to allow the song of peace to enter your soul. So, of course, God loves when we sing him songs. He gave us worship music. He actually allowed music to physiologically change our brains. The chemicals in our brains actually go out into our body. Now I'm saying, yes, we sing him a song, but imagine if we made him our song. Imagine if I moved only to the genre of Jesus. You ever heard that? What's your favorite genre? Blues, jazz, hip-hop. Well, my genre is Jesus. How do you like that? And when I move to Jesus, the beat of the world can't move me. What are you talking about, the beat of the world? Yeah, the beat of the world. It's provocative. It's seductive. In fact, not only is there the negative beat of the world, there's that positive beat down of the world where it tries to beat you down and beat you back. Unless you're standing on the rock of Jesus Christ and you're moving to the genre of Jesus and the music in your soul is actually his life, the world will get you to rock and roll to its grooves. It will. It will be inevitable. If Jesus is not the song of your soul, you will begin to move to the rhythm of the world. Psalms 55, 22. Cast your burden on the Lord and he shall sustain you. Guess what the second part says? He shall never permit the righteous to be moved. Isn't that perfect how this all fell together? We start with the song of the soul. We talk about him being rock. Then we learn how to roll. And at the very end, he says, I will not allow you to be moved. I will not allow what you're going through to move you when you allow me to get inside of you. Yes, I want, you want to get out? I, I get that. You want to be delivered from your situation? But let me move inside of you, and I will deliver the anxiety from you. I'll get rid of the worry when you begin to allow my music within you, my life, my song, to be the tune. Ultimately, as we close, the song of the soul is knowing that God is always in control. So church, will you take the tune of that truth with you tonight? Will you allow that melody to be your liberty? And since we're not dead, we're not done. We've heard it. Let's do it. Let us pray.